and welcome to Reimagine version 14, our university edition. If this is your first time joining us, welcome in. And if not, thanks for tuning back in. We've interviewed over 600 project teams and thought leaders in the space. And the goal of our virtual conference is to educate and inform all, including those new to the crypto space, long-time holders, and industry professionals. So make sure to subscribe below to keep staying informed and enjoy what we have in store for you today. And what we have in store for you today is returning to our conference series, Mr. Mark Yusko, founder and CEO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. Excited to have you back once again, Mark. How are you doing? Ah, thanks for having me. Great to be with you all and great to be in, in series 14. That's unbelievable. Yeah, all the way. We're all the way in number 14 here. Uh, before we uh, move on to introducing our student panelists, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your career uh, yep. just in general, and what began your interest in crypto? Yeah, so the quick version, I, I don't do quick well, but people have heard it on, on previous versions. Uh, look, I grew up on, on the left coast, uh, out near coal, uh, grew up in Seattle, Washington, uh, made my way to the Midwest for college, uh, went to Notre Dame and University of Chicago for grad school, uh, kind of got into investing by accident, uh, ended up back at my alma mater at Notre Dame, helping to manage the endowment, then came down here to North Carolina, where I am today, uh, to manage the endowment down here. And the big thing about that period of, of my life was alternative investments, hedge funds, venture capital. And we did a lot of venture capital investing, particularly venture capital investing in tech. And I had the you know great fortune or, or luck to, to be involved in some of the big tech trends uh, out there. So in the 90s, invested in little companies like Google and Yahoo and eBay, which turned into to pretty big deals. And this thing called the internet became a big deal. And then uh, left to start Morgan Creek in 2004. And about five years later, this thing started to happen around the mobile net and basically internet ubiquity and e-commerce. And uh, so we made some big investments in companies like Alibaba and Facebook and, and a few others. And and so I started to notice this trend. And so I went back and, and I looked and there's this technological evolution that's been going on since the advent of computing. 1954 was the mainframe, 68 was the microchip, 82 is the personal computer, 96 was the internet, 2010 was the mobile net, and 2024, I used to call it the trust net, but now I, I've revised that to the truth net. Because with the what blockchain technology does is it replaces trust that we've relied on for you know, 800 years with the banking industry, you were talking about being in Florence. And look, the Medici's, benevolent as they may be, maybe not so much, uh, have been the trusted third party along with the Rothschilds and the Morgans for 800 years. And the banking industry has had a stranglehold on being a source of trust when you have to transact value. What blockchain does, it unlocks that. We no longer need a trusted third party. We can use software and code. And you know, I'll leave you with this one little thing. So I live in the South, and if you get lost in the South, and 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 David does too, you don't stop and ask directions, right? Because they'd say, "Oh, go to where the oak tree was and take a left," and then go to where the general store was and take a right. I'm like, I I don't know where that is. I didn't live here then. So what do you do? You look at Google Maps or Apple Maps, and and you find your way. So same thing today is we don't need people to be the trusted third parties. We have code, and in code we trust. And so in 2013, I got exposed to digital assets, blockchain, crypto. I say I was not running drugs on Silk Road. I was not a cryptography student. Didn't, didn't get it immediately in 2013. But by 2015, 16, I finally had done the work, embraced kind of infrastructure. And, and there are really two tacks, right? There's cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, et cetera. And then there's blockchain technology. So I'm all in on blockchain technology. Uh, we've started a venture capital group called Morgan Creek Digital, raised three funds, raising our fourth. Uh, we've made about 70 different investments in infrastructure companies, but I'm actually all in on, on crypto itself as well. Um, big believers in, in Bitcoin and, and others, so uh, have made a number of investments there as well. So told you I don't do short, sorry. <laughs> no, that's quite all right. We did. We have spoken some already uh, in this uh, conference series about how people do need that trusted third party, and maybe, maybe not uh, Web 3.0 is there yet. But but we're making we're making strides. So hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Yep. But 
As I mentioned before, this is our university edition, and our focus in this edition was to invite student blockchain partners to come ask questions and discuss groundbreaking new technologies with some of the most influential thought and business leaders in the industry. And so in that vein, our company Mousebelt has been working with more than 80 student blockchain organizations from universities spanning multiple continents, providing support in a variety of ways from internships, office hour sponsorships, as well as early stage projects investment. Today joining me as well on the co-panel for our discussion uh, alongside our other special guest is Mr. David Loudon, Vice President of Blockchain at Virginia Tech and Cole Carnell, co-founder of Blockchain at Portland State. Gentlemen, uh, nice to meet you. And before we move on to the interview, if you could each uh, tell us a little bit about your club, um, how many members, maybe the outlay of the majors in your club um, and the activities that y'all have gotten up to, maybe have planned for the future. And I think we'll go ahead and start with Mr. David Loudon out in Virginia Tech. Sure, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, like you said, I'm David Loudon from Virginia Tech. Um, we, uh, I was a co-founder of Blockchain at Virginia Tech uh, last fall. Uh, we saw a good rise and we we're having about 20 to 40 members come out uh, last year and we're growing that this year. Uh, we have a mix of cyber, uh, cybersecurity, computer science, business, business information technology students, and also some economics and philosophy majors. So we really, really pull from all directions. Uh, we like to be really inclusive and bring in guest speakers who are able to uh, uh, accommodate for people who are curious about blockchain technology, maybe don't know too much, but also uh, bring have some higher level stuff available for those looking to take the next step. Um, so we love bringing in guest speakers. We're looking to do a couple of hackathons in the coming semesters um, and as well as some projects. So uh, yeah, thank you again for having me. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Sounds exciting. Long runway out there uh, in Blacksburg. And uh, we've also got, as I said before, Mr. Cole Carnell, uh, co-founder of Blockchain at Portland State. Happy, glad to have you, Cole. Thanks, Miguel. Glad to be here. Yeah, I co-founded Blockchain at Portland State back in 2019 when Portland State had just established a blockchain and business program, a certificate program. And I basically stumbled into a meeting session about it after having used Bitcoin in the past for various things, such as Silk Road, Mark. And uh, I came into the meeting really excited because Bitcoin in general is an extremely interesting topic. And we left the meeting having founded the Blockchain at Portland State organization. And it's proven to be the most popular business club on campus for the three years that I've been involved in it. Um, the number of members seems to shift by the year. People come and go, but it's usually around around like 10 or so officers start out the year. And by the end of the year, we're usually closing at like 60 or, seven or, act 60 or 70 active participants. So very popular. And uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, what recent kind of activities do y'all have planned or are y'all gonna get into uh, in the coming year? So blockchain at Portland State, um, definitely educational sessions will be planned for fall term and then expansion into probably a regional blockchain alliance. Like I know that Virginia Tech, David's um, club has partnered with other Virginia schools to create a regional blockchain council, which is extremely valuable. And I'd like to see something going on with the Pacific Northwest schools in that area. Awesome, yeah, definitely. I agree, I agree. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the questions now, and um, we can go ahead. I normally start with the opposite of who I introduced first, but there's a little bit of a history here. So we'll go ahead and start in Blacksburg with uh, Mr. Loudon. Go ahead, David, if you, if you want to give it a shot with the first question. Sure. So uh, for my first question, uh, I know there's been a lot of controversy re recently uh, about different crypto companies that offer custodial services, uh, some of them offering yield. Um, so my question is, do you think there will ever be a uh, long-term trusted custodial solution for crypto, uh, or will it always be not your keys, not your crypto? Oh, fantastic, fantastic question, and, and one that uh, I take some, some grief on. You know, I, I will, will surf spaces at night uh, to, to different places, and I'll, I'll go on a, a Bitcoin maxi space, and I'm like, get out of here, you shitcoiner. I'm like, what are you talking about? I have more Bitcoin than you. Look at the sign. And they're like, 
yeah, but you own Ethereum and you own Solana. I'm like, yeah, I do. Made a lot of money in both of them. So, um, but look, the, this whole thing about not your keys, not your coins, it it strikes a really tough chord with me because look, if if the only purpose of Bitcoin is to put it on a thumb drive and bury it in your backyard, don't need it. We got that. It's called gold, right? Gold's been doing that for 5,000 years as a perfect store of value. A single ounce of gold has bought a fine person suit for 5,000 years from, you know, Elizabethan times to a suit of armor to a zoot suit to Savile Row today. So if, if it's just about, you know, opting out and, you know, screw the man and, uh, I'm going to have my my currency that that isn't can't be corrupted by the central banks. That's fine, but again, I could do the same thing with gold. And yes, digital is better. I, I look, I, I do believe Bitcoin is digital gold. It is more portable. It's more, uh, it's lighter. And all the gold in the world fits into Olympic sized swimming pools. All the Bitcoin in the world fits right here. And I don't have all the Bitcoin in the world. In fact, I don't keep any on my phone. Don't SIM swap me. I've been SIM swapped twice. They got nothing. So don't do it. Um, and by the way, people who use their phone number for two-factor authentication, please stop. Use a second email address. Never use your phone number. It's too easy to SIM swap. Um, PSA. But that's a long answer, David, to, to a really important question, which is, look, I believe, and, and again, I take grief because I'll go to an Ethereum space and then I like, get out of here, you Bitcoin maxing. What are you talking about? Again, I have more Ethereum than you do, but that's not the point, is the tribalism in crypto has got to go. It's just got to stop. It's not healthy. It's not productive. And this, this whole nonsense of there is only one, right? Bitcoin is the only one and everything else is a scam or a shit coin. That's dumb. It doesn't mean it, it couldn't happen that way, that we could have a single chain, mono chain world. Look, if I knew the answer, I'd, I'd probably not have a job, right? Because the $64 trillion question is, are we going to have a single chain world? Bitcoin, Lightning, Layer 3, Layer 4, and it all is on a single chain. Or are we going to have a tech stack like we do in the internet? We have you know, IP, then TCP IP. Then we have file uh, uh, FTP for files. Then we got SMTP, HTTP, and www. Are we going to have Bitcoin, Filecoin, Ethereum is the www dot, and then maybe Polkadot, maybe Cosmos, maybe Solana, maybe Avalanche. I don't know what's what the other two are. Or are we going to have a multi-chain world where we have lots of L1s and L2s and L3s? Man, I don't know. Uh, I do know blockchains or chain will eventually supplant most of the traditional infrastructure uh, that tech runs on today, and and we'll get rid of, you know, the seventy year old technology of, you know, Fedwire and ACH and Swift. I mean, all that needs to go away. But ultimately, I believe that Bitcoin, in particular, should be deposited. It should be lent. It should be borrowed. It should be spent. It should be used. It should have velocity, and. And look, we're investors in both sides. I mean, we have investments in, you know, the the, the maxis, and we have investors, uh, and, and I would put, you know, Caitlin Long in Custodia in that, right? She believes no no rehypothecation, fully reserved. Fine, that's fine. But I actually believe you should rehypothecate. I believe fractional reserve banking isn't the devil. I believe it. It actually separates really successful countries from not successful countries. Name a country with non-functioning fractional reserve banking that's great. I'll wait. You can't do it. Um, so I do think, now, banking cabals, all run by the Rothschilds and the Morgans, bad. Um, but an open banking system uh, with a digital banking system uh, run on Bitcoin or, or other blockchains, I think is, is interesting. So really, you really know, long answer to a really, really important question. It is, it is not that I, I do understand the trepidation that comes, uh, from the, not my keys. I, I don't have the custody of it, but there is likely a solution that involves blockchain given that 
you know, we have vacation rental by owner, I can go rent my car out. And that doesn't mean that I give the deed to those things to somebody else, you know, so yeah. I do, I do foresee a solution coming soon. So I'm glad that you agree. Well, the that. other and thing, Envy is, go ahead, absolutely. you know, this is important. The, the other point there is you think about transitions, right? I, I get the logic, the pure logic of a decentralized financial system. And I get the logic of a deflationary currency like Bitcoin being superior to fiat currency. Look, history of the world, 775 paper currencies, three quarters of them no longer exist. I get that. Every paper currency will eventually go to zero because governments trend towards dictatorship. They start democratic, they head toward dictatorship, emperors, et cetera. All empires fall. Everyone gets massively in debt. And the only way out is to devalue your currency. So I get that. Opting out for some portion of your wealth makes sense. But I don't want all of it outside the system because I have to live in the system, right? Now, I can't pay my rent in Bitcoin. I can't pay for, you know, poppy with Bitcoin or whatever. Maybe someday. But we need a more stable unit of account. Uh, and, and just like money, right? We don't use money, most of us. Some of us still use paper currency, but I use my Visa card. Visa is money to me, but it really isn't. It's a database, right? It's actually a database that runs on a mainframe on COBOL, God forbid. Um, it's true. And it settles to chain Fedwire once a month. I send my check in, it settles once a month. The rest of the month is just, right? Transactions going back and forth on a database. So the same idea could work in the digital asset world where we could have CFI, centralized finance, sitting in between the old TradFi, which needs to die and not die like immediately and go away and never be heard from again. It could function as lenders and, and you know custodians for, for hard to value. Because one of the problems is real assets and digital assets. If I have a unique digital asset, really easy to see why that should always be in blockchain. A physical asset, like a piece of property, the title could be digital, but I still have to have somebody go there and make sure it didn't get washed away in the hurricane. I still got to make sure that that renter actually leaves when they're supposed to leave. So there are some physical elements that can't be solved. We, we all won't live just in the metaverse. So there's going to be this integration of the physical and digital world that will require some hybrid solutions. And I think CFI plays that role. And lastly, my dad, 84 years old, never going to hold his own keys. Just not going to happen. Yeah, exactly. He's going to have a Coinbase account and he is very happy. He thinks he owns Bitcoin. He says, no, he doesn't own Bitcoin. You tell him he doesn't own Bitcoin. He believes yeah. he owns Bitcoin. He's benefited from the rise in the price. He's very happy. And I'm not going to hold his keys because if I lost him, I'd be dead. And I, this, not, this is not happening. So that functionality for those transitioning who aren't digital natives, right? People listening to this at university who grew up with you know the iPhone in their hand, they get it. They're comfortable in digital world. Not all of them, by the way, but most. And that's fine. But that other generation, no chance they're going directly to holding their keys. Just not happening. So I know Cole had something about the uh, the traditional CFI uh, integration, maybe all coins as well. Yeah. So a question surrounding that would have to be around the central bank digital currencies. This has to do with the permissioned versus permissionless blockchains to the private versus the public. Um, there's been a lot of discussion on what type of protocol or the rails the government will use to establish a CBDC. Do you have any insights into what protocol they've been looking at? I know Ripple is a big discussion point on this. Look, it, it, it's it's a really, really important point. And you know, my view on this is is very black and white. Um, CBDCs are not cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are decentralized, CBDCs are centralized, and therefore they are evil incarnate, right? Strong words, but I believe they are. I believe they are made for surveillance states and for control. 
And if people watching this have ever seen the 147 minute, minute 47 clip of Augustine, I can't remember his last name, the guy from the BIS, who looks like Kingpin from the Spider-Man movie. I mean, he weighs 500 pounds if he's an ounce. Mm -hmm. And the dude is one of the most frightening people I have ever seen in my life. When he describes how CBDC would work and how, of course, we should have control of how you spend your money. So imagine this dystopian world, right? You get paid on Friday. You go out and have a couple of cocktails, start drunk texting about the president. You wake up and your money is worth 70 cents on the dollar. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not the life I want to live, right? I, I have freedom of speech. Well, not in a CBDC world, CBDC world. So the question you're asking, which I don't really have an answer for, is what protocol are they going to go down the path? So it clearly isn't going to be fully decentralized like you know a Bitcoin equivalent or, well, the way Ethereum used to be before the merge. Um, so what are they going to do? Is it XRP? Is it something similar to that? I actually don't have any insight, don't have any inside knowledge, inside baseball there. My guess is it's unlikely to be, again, if you're if I were a betting person, I wouldn't bet on any of the existing protocols. I would bet they're going to kind of create their own. Um, but who knows? And, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know the answer to this. I, I probably should. Does anyone, do any of you know what the digital rem and B runs on? Oh, that's a good question. Maybe cool. No. Yeah. So that, that's a question that, you know, that should that's give us question. some insight is because the digital rem and B does exist. It is a yeah. central bank digital currency and it's running on something. I just, I, I just personally don't know what. I thought it's not. It's definitely not Bitcoin. Um, my guess is it's not XRP either. Is it some new thing, or is it some other chain from, you know, a, a hard fork or something? I, again, I just don't know the answer. So, I think uh, as, proprietary, and highly guarded. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, my guess would be the U.S. government would go the same way. And I also hear rumor that Russia is this close. And I've said for years, actually, that China would be first, Russia would be second, the US would be a distant third. And we tried, right? Pomp and I actually, you know, talked to senators, tried to get people to listen, uh, that they needed to embrace this back in 2018 and 19. And they're like, go away, you know, you're a crypto kid. I mean, him, not me. Um, but it it's sad, right? They They... I think now get it. I mean, there are a few Senator Lummis and others who kind of get it. Uh, actually, our, our congressman here from from North Carolina um, is you know pretty good, Patrick Henry. Um, but love that name too. Uh, but I don't know if he's related to the original. Um, <laughs> but uh, I I think this question matters. You know, it's funny. Again, I go I go to the Twitter Spaces and and I've been doing a show couple times with uh, it's sponsored by the xrp army and and i like, come on what do we have to do to convince you that xrp is is the thing like well two things one explain to me why the foundation still owns 70 odd percent of it that that makes me nervous i, I think that's pretty centralized i don't like it um and two help me understand an actual implementation use case i hear Garlinghouse and others talk about a lot of projects, but I actually never see evidence. And I'm, I know I'm pissing off all the, the XRP people, but uh, I just don't see it. And I want to see it. I want them or someone like them to be successful. Um, but I see actually more output from like the Paxo side than I do the XRP side. Definitely. No, I, 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 uh, I agree with that. There's a lot of projects out there that I'm not sure what their use case is yet. So um, mm -hmm. we'll go ahead and throw it out back to David just uh, in Blacksburg if you got another one. I think I heard you made a comment about um, ETH now post merge. Uh, so this is kind of similar to CBDCs, but 
Uh, basically, if CBDCs are implemented, can a DeFi ecosystem exist separately? But also, um, do you think that the Ethereum merge has made it kind of a centralized government coin almost? So it, it's it's a really interesting conundrum, and you know the the proof of stakers would would yell at me for saying no, absolutely not. I'm a proof of work guy, right? I one I don't buy into any of the nonsense fud about you know green and and uh, ESG. I think it's just stupid. Tumble dryers use more electricity than Bitcoin does. And we're going to ban tumble dryers and everybody walk around with wet clothes or have clothes lines again. It's just silly. So, I mean, in fact, everything that we do every day is about converting energy to value, right? Think about what you did this morning. You got up, put fuel in your body, and we are trying to create value by, you know, using our brains or we make widgets or we dig ditches or it's energy into value. That, that's what life is about. And so to take electricity and turn it into a thing that you can store value in permanently, I mean, the one that I just love, right, is flared natural gas. You've seen the picture of the United States, you know, North Dakota and Texas at night look lit up. Everything else is dark because they're flaring gas. Really bad for the environment, horrible. So what do you do? You take that gas, you know, flare and you stick a uh, micro turbine on it and you connect a, you know, Bitcoin miner. And now you can mine Bitcoin, convert that energy that isn't polluting the environment into value that you can send anywhere in the world through the internet. No transmission wires, no pipelines, no right-of-ways, no dead birds, no dead salamanders. Awesome. But no one talks about that. So that to me is a net positive. You got negative electricity cost and a net positive for carbon. Of course, I don't believe in carbon either. But um, just because you can't measure a thousand-year trend on a one-year period. Um, weather patterns change. Uh, go back 150 million years and look how much carbon was in the environment. But back to the original point, um, proof of stake, proof of work. Proof of stake harkens back to the bad old days, right? He who has the gold makes the rules. If you have a bigger stack, then you get to authenticate the block. If you're a bad actor, you can do bad things. Now, I'm not saying anybody is a bad actor, but it does allow for control in a centralized way. Now people say, oh, but that won't happen because the incentives are right. And that if you do a 51% attack, then the value goes to zero. I actually agree with that, mostly. And I think that's the genius of the proof of work system is when it says, oh, you could have too much concentration of miners. Nope, the minute, the minute you change a block, and you spend all this money to hack, you know, 10,000 nodes simultaneously or 51% of 10,000 nodes simultaneously in 10 minutes, which you couldn't do. But if you could spend, what, 100 million bucks to do that, the minute you did it, it goes to zero and you just lost $100 million. No one would do it. So that is an elegant solution against hacking of a proof of work blockchain. In proof of stake, you don't have to spend $100 million to hack all these devices. All you got to do is have a big stack. And so, could you steal enough in a short amount of time to make it worthwhile? I don't know. I don't know. But I, I feel like it's more likely in proof of stake than proof of work. It's kind of like the guy, and I wish I could give the guy credit because I think he was only like 14 or 15 years old. And he found this project uh, that went to a DAO. And it was majority, not yeah, it was majority rules. So it wasn't even like super majority, like 50% or 75. It was just whoever had the biggest stack got to change the rules. And make a long story short, I think he he got to like 11 or 12%, created a proposal to have a super mint, minted himself a trillion tokens, and then sold a billion dollars worth before the token went to zero. Bravo. I mean, genius. I mean, I don't like the fact that you could exploit it that way, but Bravo for being a genius to do that. I don't know if you had to give any of the money back or whether you know it's free and clear. It's actually in a book by Cam Harvey that talks about this. And I should be, I should go back and read it so I could give the guy credit because it's amazing. Um, and now I want my 11 year old to figure out how to do that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, um, well, was, I was, I was, no, gonna, no, I was the, the, the first part of the question. Right. So the second part is proof of proof of stake, I think is inferior to proof of work personally. I'm not, I don't like it, so I, I wouldn't have done the merge, but they did the merge, and and everyone thought after the merge, the thing was going to explode and go to 10,000. It didn't, 
So, you know, buy the rumor, sell the news. Um, the first part of the question, what was the first part of the question again? Uh, in a world where CBDCs are oh, yeah. reality, uh, how, like, I guess- Yeah, can, can you have DeFi in, in, look, CBDCs are just digital fiat. Right. DeFi is a decentralized system that exists next to or on top of or side by side or however you want to say uh concentric with um fiat so yeah they can coexist and people will choose how much of their fiat they want to transfer into this decentralized world you know i don't have a hundred percent of my assets in decentralized assets i have a decent percentage but not a hundred because i said i live in the fiat world, I spend in the fiat world. Like I pay my electricity bill in fiat, I pay my rent in fiat or my mortgage in fiat. So uh, until such time as they do something completely sinister, like a CBDC, CBDC where they can extract value from me because I did something they don't like, I jaywalked, so they take my money, then I'm out, right? And then I think DeFi will be will be significantly more attractive. But in the short run, to me, there's no difference between fiat and centralized, except it makes fiat worse. Because fiat's bad because it can be inflated away by printing more of it from thin air, hence the word fiat. But it's super bad when you can inflate it away and control it down to the individual person. That's ugly. Like right now, they can inflate all of our money, which is what they've done, right? Over the last 24 months, they printed half of all the dollars in the history of the Republic, 246 years, half in two years. So what happened to the value of our money? It went down. What happened to the price of everything? It went up. Okay. So they did that to all of us, but they didn't do it to you or to me because we did something wrong. So that fiat world has existed for thousands of years and, you know, Actually, more hundreds of years. For the first thousands, we were more tethered to gold and silver and 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 hard currencies. But in a fiat money, paper money world, which really paper money started in the 1300s, but really didn't take off until the Rothschilds in the 1600s, when the first central bank in the Netherlands was created, and then the Bank of England in the 1700s really accelerated it because they colonized the world and put their money everywhere. So call it 300 odd, 400 year odd old experiment. And it's it's been okay. I mean, life's actually much better today than it was then. Um, but it's teetering on some, some really bad uh, outcomes. And, and that's why I think DeFi exists. Look, I'm wearing my, um, actually, actually, I can show you guys. I'm wearing my Genesis block socks today. You know, oh, pretty nice. It talks about... Um, you know, the chance are bailing out the banks. It's not a coincidence that Bitcoin was created in the middle of the global financial crisis. That is not an accident, right? It's not an accident that Satoshi Nakamoto's birthday is 4575. 45 was the date on which gold was made illegal in 1933. And 1975 was when it was made legal again to own. Also not a coincidence. And I think this is cool. This, this young woman, daughter of uh, this friend of mine, Lisa Huff, her daughter said, you know, it was executive order 6102 and 21 with six zeros is 21 million. That's why there's 21 million Bitcoin. I'm like, mind blown. 17 year old girl thinks, wow, because where did 21 million come from? It's why? Why, why that number? 6102, 21 and six zeros, kind of cool. Even if it's not true, it's really cool. But all of this, goes to where we are today, right? We're on the verge of global financial crisis too, right? We're recording this on the Monday when Credit Suisse was supposedly you know, bankrupt and the Fed had to pull an emergency meeting. And there's a great tweet by you know, one of our managers, Travis, I think it was Travis, the Dickie guy. No, somebody else um, that said, why is it that the economy is still run by a bunch of old white guys behind closed doors? I mean, literally, male, pale, and stale is is no way to go through life, even though maybe I am that. 
<laughs> they were they were talking on Yahoo Finance this morning about oh we need another plaza accord and all this nonsense and I am I am of the opinion as just a layman security you know professional that any any talk of CBDCs by uh, you know administration or governmental officials is is simply a placation like like it's just to mm -hmm. placate people because once they start to move into that space you. It's just social credit by, by blockchain, like you said. And, and when people experience that and then see that they have a uh, just some other sort of, well, I have to go over here and I have to do all this extra stuff, but hey, they can't take my money away anymore. You, you've just lost as a government. You stepped onto somebody else's territory and you've lost yeah. and governments don't, don't exist to lose. Well, look, why, why are governments railing against stable coins, right? When it was a <laughs> few million dollars moving to stable coins, no big deal. When it's billions, no big deal. Tens of billions? What the fuck? I mean, they got pissed. So look, Luna, bad, not a stable coin, dumb. Okay, so it, it crashes. Not a coincidence that, you know, Janet Yellen the next day is saying we need to regulate stable coins. So did they cause that debacle? by shorting Bitcoin against the treasury and all the stuff that, you know, the guy tweeted about in November and whoever did it went like line by line through that tweet and did exactly what they, what he said to do. I don't know. Doesn't really matter. What does matter is there's a famous quote that Gandhi actually didn't say, but everyone thinks it's Gandhi. You know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And I wish again, remember who said it so I could give him credit, but from 2009 to 15, from the day of, of my socks till 2015 was the first day ignore you. Bunch of nerds and geeks running drugs on Silk Road, playing with magic internet money. Who, who cares? Whatever. Then they laugh at you. 2016 to 21, ah, bunch of nerds and geeks. Look at these stupid people spend all this time wasting all this electricity. Then they fight you. Right now, for the next five years, they're going to fight. And they're going to fight hard through regulation, through, you know, coercion, through media, through FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. All of it is because now real money is leaving the fiat system. And the fiat system is already over levered, which is what we're seeing in Europe. And when you remove deposits from an over levered system, it gets more over levered and more vulnerable. And that's, that's where we are today. So they clearly don't want that money to leave the system. And even though I said it's not all my money, but any amount hurts them. And they would much rather have it be theirs than ours. A good micro example of that, oh no, we can't with the over leveraging is Celsius, as we've seen just in, inside the, the ecosystem. I mean, I'm a victim of that. I know a bunch of people that are. I mean, just like anything else, it's, you know, you only give somebody else what you can afford to lose, like I told everybody, and sure enough. Yeah, but that's, I mean, the problem with that it, It's is, not exactly the no, same. No, 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 no. It's true. Yeah. You, should only, you should only do what you can afford to lose, except when you do something with someone you're supposed to be able to trust, yeah. oh. you trust them to be trustworthy. But as people in the SNL crisis, again, you guys are too young to remember this, this thing in the SNL crisis, that there are all these you know, competitor organizations to the banks and people put their money in it. And then bad guys got in charge and they basically made bad loans to each other and wrecked the depositors. So those depositors are so, oh, you shouldn't put all your money in the bank. Well, no, I, I've always put all my money in the bank. So why should I? But what you should have thought about is, is Joe's savings and loan as you know reliable as Bank of America? Uh, not that Bank of America was very reliable in the global financial crisis, but but depositors didn't get wiped out. So in the savings loan crisis, you lost a lot of money. And the same thing's true here. Celsius did wrong by its depositors, full stop, right? I mean, they didn't fully collateralize their loan book. They made bad decisions as management, but that's different. That's a different kind of failure than a protocol failure, right? Or a hack. You know, if somebody steals your stuff, that's very different than management making bad decisions. And, you know, we are all 
victims of those bad decisions by Celsius management, the most egregious, and the same thing that happened with Luna, is when you have a variable asset, an asset where the price can vary, backing something that you sell as stable, you have an asset liability mismatch. It's like what happened with you know, CDOs and, and all the nonsense and subprime. It's what happens when banks get over levered like Deutsche Bank or Credit Suisse. When you, you know, borrow uh, short and lend long, it's bad if you mismatch your assets and liabilities. And so I, I'm not going to let Alex and the gang off the hook quite as easy as they were victims. We, the people who used it, were the victims. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you agree with me there because I know that there was a Bank of, of Canada uh, individual up there, and that's why I kind of put my trust. Don't hold your breath yet. I'm glad you said we're all victims because I, I hold some Credit Suisse uh, investments as well. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, we'll throw it back to Cole in Portland, um, maybe for one last one. And if you did want to follow up, Ms. Uh, David, uh, we can go ahead and do that, but we're running short on time. Yeah, so I guess my last question would be related to the students that I work with. Um, so a lot of the time, I'll get student people interested in crypto coming into the meetings, and they have big dollar signs in their eyes, seeing the swings in, you know, the percentage yields in the crypto market, thinking that they're going to be the next ones to get rich. Mm -hmm. And they want to pile all their money into what they have into the crypto market. And it, it just seems like a bad idea, but of course, it's not really many other asset classes that can compete with the performance of crypto right now on a daily basis with the volatility. What would you say to these kinds of students? Um, <laughs> yeah. So one, it, it's tough, right? Concentration makes you rich. Every large fortune came from a concentrated bet, concentrated stock position, concentrated real estate position business ownership. So it's hard not to want to do that. Now, the problem is for every success story that you read about, for every Apple, you know, started in a garage, there were 99 or probably 999 others that you don't read about because history is written by the winners. So if getting rich was easy, then everyone would be rich. Getting rich is not easy. Now, it doesn't mean you can't get lucky. It doesn't mean you can't do well doesn't mean if you work really hard and study really hard and, and follow a consistent plan. But part of the problem with the stars in your eyes or the dollar signs in your eyes is yes, if you're early to any innovation, in fact, it's my pin tweet on Twitter, right? The greatest wealth is created by investing in something you believe in before others even understand it. And you'll be mocked and ridiculed for your non consensus action, but it's totally worth it. So we made tons of money. For Notre Dame, not for me, but for Notre Dame, when I worked, you know, there and we invested in Google, we put in half a million dollars, took out $200 million. Awesome, right? There should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. Why? Well, because they totally fundamentally changed the way we think about doing search. They don't actually search the internet, right? They own half the websites. And every time you type a question, about halfway through the question, they're already sending you to the website that has all the answers. And if it's a new question, they make a new website. So that was a fundamentally different way of doing business. So that innovation, you know, made you a lot of money. And if you were early investor in Google, made a lot of money. Early investor in Microsoft, where I grew up, right? Made a lot of money. I have a lot of friends, don't have to work anymore because they went to work at Microsoft. I didn't. And I always defend myself saying, Google the picture of the Microsoft 11, you won't blame me, right? They're pretty rough looking. Now they're multi-billionaires and I'm not, so I shouldn't make fun of them, but they're kind of funny looking. Um, we're all bad looking in the 70s. Clothes were bad, hair was bad, beards were bad. You guys' beards are nice, but their beards were bad. Um, but again, they're multi-billionaires and I'm not. So again, long answer to say, in any, I mean, if you're an investor, right? There are four types of market participants. Investors buy things they believe sell below fair value and hold them until they become fairly valued. That's what an investor does. Then there are traders. Traders don't give a crap about fair value. They just want stuff that moves and they want a long or short. And most people are really bad at trading, like horrible. But there are some people who are good at it. But most people are really bad. Day traders are the worst. And the worst thing that could happen to a day trader, and this happens all the time in crypto, you make that first trade and it goes up. 
and you think it's you. It's not you. That's luck. And if you keep doing it, the house will take all your money because the odds are stacked against you in trading. Uh, the professionals will take, will take, you know, eat your lunch. Third part market participants are speculators. Speculators are just the opposite of hedgers. Hedgers have to sell like oil producers or gold producers and speculators take the other side in usually in the futures market or the options market. And then there are gamblers. And this is the problem. In the pandemic, we locked people in their house or in their apartment. We gave them free money. We turned off sports and we said, all right, why don't you gamble on the stock market or the crypto market? And the problem was it was a number go up time. It was a bull market. Number went up. Everybody felt rich. People felt like it was them. And they kept doing it. And then bang, we're back into a crypto winter bear market or bear market and stock market. Now everybody's not making any money. You don't see Davy Day Trader out there with his green hammer talking anymore about how easy it is. And suddenly it's hard. And so I think what, what those anyone in one of your clubs or one of these organizations or, or listening to this or going, going to school is first be an investor, right? Try to find things that sell below fair value. I believe Bitcoin today trades below fair value. You can find fair value pretty easily using Metcalf's law, right? So I'm an accumulator. Um, Ethereum, a little tougher. Um, XRP, a little tougher. But there are certain networks that you can value. And if you can buy it when it's below fair value, great. Second thing, don't trade unless you have some edge. And people have edges. They have information edge. They have you know uh, computing edge. But in the world of high frequency trading, do you, anytime you, you want to buy something, think about this. Someone else is selling. What do they know that you don't? Anytime you're selling, someone else is buying. What do they know that you don't? And in trading, your competition, Ken Griffin. Ken's one of the five smartest people I've ever met in my life. I mean, Ken's a better trader than his traders. He's a better accountant than his CFO. He's a better lawyer than his general counsel. He is amazing. And he's built one of the most amazing businesses in the world. So when Robin Hood traders think they're winning, Ken was winning. Ken was winning at, at Citadel. So just think about who you're up against if you want to be a trader. Okay, you want to be a speculator? Fantastic. Then stick to places where you have a natural edge against the hedgers. Right, oil producers must always sell their production forward. Okay, so you have an edge. Same thing with gold miners, etc. But don't try to speculate on stuff that you don't really understand just because the price is moving. And then fourth, don't ever be a gambler. And the gamblers are the people who use leverage. So I have a story. I shouldn't rat out my brother, but my brother called me uh, in November, December, and he's like, "They stole my Bitcoin." What are you talking about? It's like, oh, I went to Bitfinex. I'm like, stop. You levered up an 80 vol asset. Okay. Bitcoin has an 80 volatility. It's the same volatility as Amazon stock. Do you lever Amazon up 20 times or 30 times? Yeah, you, know, you put two turns of leverage on it in a margin account, fine, but don't put 10 times or 20 times. Okay. You got a margin call. You didn't pay it. They took your Bitcoin. They didn't steal it, they seized the collateral. Now, some would say that's their business model. They entice people to do it and then they steal it. Okay, fine. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm just saying maybe that's possible, but they didn't steal it. They did exactly what the contract says. So don't be a speculator. Don't use leverage. Uh, leverage is a tool. If you have a long asset like a house, lever it all day, right? Because they don't mark to market every day. If you want to use a modest amount of leverage in stock trading or crypto trading, you know, one turn, two turns, fine. Even then, don't you know? put all your money in, have enough to make your margin calls. But ultimately, uh, don't do it for the money, right? We all want to, uh, and what I mean by that is, is don't do it for the get rich quick money. Do it for the accumulation of wealth reasons that, you know, one, start early, two, diversify. So I mean, Mark, you said concentration makes you rich. I know we're not in the get rich business. We're in the stay rich business. Now, when you're young, I will modify. When you're young, you can take more risk than when you're old. When you're an old guy like me, don't take a lot of risk, right? You've already made your money, diversify it, make lots of individual bets. I make lots of little bets in companies that I think can do really well, particularly in the venture capital space. When you're young, you want to you wanna make some concentrated bets? Fine, because then you can always go earn more money. But 
don't be surprised if you lose a lot. Because remember, the legends, Julian Robertson, George Soros, the best people in this business are right 57, 58% of the time. The average Wall Street analyst is right 40% of the time. In what world can you be wrong six times out of 10 and still make a million dollars? My mind is blown. So I've got you there. I've got you there. You only need a 333 batting average to get into Cooperstown. There you go. There you go. So, but the thing is, most people to that point do the opposite of what it takes to be successful. So in investing, what most people do is they pull their flowers and water their weeds, right? As soon as something's up 10%, they sell it because they're afraid of losing it. And when something goes down, they buy more to prove they were right. You're not right. You're just wrong. The market's always right. So what you should do, and that Paul Tudor Jones, famous legendary trader from, from UVA, in his dorm room, picture, losers, average losers. Don't chase it down. Just sell. Live to fight another day. But when something's working, buy more. Right? You know? And then ultimately rebalance. Right? Rebalancing is good too. But winners press winners. And Julian Robertson, my mentor, right, passed away a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Uh, God rest his soul. One of the most amazing investors on the planet. And he had this amazing knack to double up. So when something was working, he would press the accelerator. Now, he would rebalance over time too, but he would never double down. If something went against him, he's like, I'm out, I'm wrong. Take losses faster, press your winners, and, and do have a little bit of diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one crypto. At least that's my advice. So just finishing up here, that's some great advice for young investors and um, you know our uh, co-panel here. I want to thank uh, coming out once again to our conference series, Mr. Mark Yusko, the founder and CEO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. Thank you, Mark, and my condolences. No, oh, no, no, no worries. I mean, Julian lived a great life. He, he lived to, to be into his 90s. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, if, if, when people pass away young, it's, it's a shame and a tragedy. But uh, if you make it to your 90s, it's a hell of a ride. So he had a great life. And, and we all celebrate his, his incredible, his incredible life. But uh, thank you for the condolences. But no, all good. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks, guys, for, for some insightful, thoughtful questions. And, uh, and for your leadership. Thank you for doing what you do on the campuses, uh, where you are. It, it means a lot to me. And part of the reason I'm, I'm doing this every day is people like you. I see the quality of the talent migrating into the digital asset space. It's like nothing I've ever seen. And I've lived through a lot of transitions. You know, the migration of talent in the internet was big. Mobile net was bigger. This is bigger, higher quality, bigger numbers and what you do to bring those groups together and, and help them flourish is, is really appreciated. And it's great for the ecosystem. It's great for the industry uh, and great for people like me who are trying to back founders. So thank you. Yes, I want to thank as well. Thank you, Mr. David Loudon, the Vice President of Blockchain at Virginia Tech and Mr. Cole Carnell, the co-founder of Blockchain Portland State. It sounds like you'll have a long, long runway. So thanks for coming out.